I want to focus a bit on glycoproteomics because uh, somehow this is uh, an important part of what we're doing. And I would like to, in fact, uh, the, the, the philosophy of uh, Glyconnect in particular is to benefit from uh, what, I, what uh, Nikki Packer or Daniel Coleridge are um, calling glycomics inspired glycoproteomics. And as it turns out, uh, the, uh, there's, um, there's a, a whole lot of, uh, this is a very good uh, review that was published not so long ago um, on the very different methods that are used to actually uh, analyze glycans. So there's, there's a real toolbox available to decipher the information in, in glycans. And of course, the most um, common and widely used is mass spectrometry. So that uh, in mass spectrometry, you, you have the, um, you, you take your glycoconjugates, you actually shave your glycoproteins, for instance, uh, with, uh, with an enzyme or chemically, uh, so that you release all the glycans and then you actually try to separate your glycans and uh, measure their masses. I mean, a, a very typical uh, approach uh, strategy that is used um, uh, with um, in proteomics uh, with peptides. And so it's the same idea. And so glycomics now is has reached a point where the, uh, the level of the accuracy and uh, the, the refinement of the structure is really possible. So you, you can have very precise structures um, assigned by mass spectrometry. In contrast, in glycoproteomics, you have other uh, levels of uh, uh, precision, but what you have is for the glycans, you, you try to keep your peptide and your glycans together. So this is what is called intact glycopeptides. And you measure the mass of this complex. Uh, and you can actually precisely measure, um, identify the mass of your peptide. But the mass you have for glycans only allow you to identify identify a composition. So you can count the number of hexos, the number of hexnacks. Of course, with tender mass spectrometry, if you dig in a, a bit further, you can, with fragments, start assigning. So you, you have a guess. Uh, you, you can do educated guesses of what the structure could be, given the composition and given the fragments that you have. So it's a bit of a puzzle. And this is why, in fact, the idea is to combine the power of glycomics that allows you to precisely identify the glycans. But unfortunately, since you have released them from, the, from, from where they are attached, uh, you don't have the site-specific information. So you have the site-specific information, but with roughly defined gly glycans um, in uh, glycoproteomics. And the idea is to actually try and map the two type of results so that you can reconstitute from the same sample. So you have the, 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 what is possible, what has been found as the glycome of that particular sample. So maybe you can actually, um, I mean, it's not maybe, in all likelihood, you can corroborate the two sources. And um, this is what we are really interested in, in doing um, bioinformatically. So one of the key issue in glycoproteomics that has been solved more or less in glycomics, but not, not uh, completely, but quite well, but not in glycoproteomics is the reproducibility. 
And so it has been a concern in glycobiology for quite a while. And so there, there are um, uh, uh, some challenges, they call challenges are often. So within that um, uh, hypo um, context, and so there were some challenges to have the same sample analyzed by independent labs and see whether you identified the same glycans. So the stability of the glycome was the first concern of the experimental challenges that had nothing to do with um, bioinformatics. Uh, more recently, um, NIST actually uh, suggested also to do some kind of inter-laboratory um, assessment to see how reproducible the identification of glycan is. So I think I don't have to advertise the power of having uh, a challenge, so a data set that is given to people who are developing software. So this example of the prediction of the 3D structure from the sequence, which has been launched in 1994 and ended up um, in 2020 with a wonderful result um, that maybe some of you have heard of, where there, there is actually now a deep learning method that is predicting with a very high confidence the 3D structure from the sequence. And it was a long way to get to there. So the importance of these challenges is such that each time software improves software uh, and even if of course um, there, it doesn't mean that it has to be due to one single software. At the moment, there's the top software that does it, but tell you what, the other ones are going to, uh, are, are emulated and they probably going to improve as well. So this is the great advantage of these challenges. So this is not happening, this is happening also on al analytical methods and these analytical methods are very much depending on Glyco on software, so glycoinformatics uh, software. And you can see, for instance, that in many instances, you have a pretty good reproducibility uh, at, uh, if you test different methods. So you have liquid chromatography, you have um, capillary electrophoresis, all sorts of separation methods that are used. And you can see that reproducibility is reachable yet not in all cases. So there is still, from the technological point of view, some um, fine tuning to be done. And this is taken care of uh, by different labs. Regarding the efficiency, so we also need to um, appraise the, um, the, 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 the power of, of all the, I, I showed you in the bubbles on the Glycomics at Exposy website, how many software, how much software there is. And it's, it's actually uh, mushrooming. And there's more than what I have put in the bubbles. Uh, some of them, whoops, sorry. Some of them are, um, still not quite, uh, not, not, I mean, they, they've been dropped uh, so, and they're not, no longer maintained. The, the oldest one is Protein Prospector. It's actually a, um, a proteomics, a search engine that has been fine-tuned to actually uh, identify uh, intact glycopeptides and they do very well, they perform very well, especially with all glycans. Um, so you can see that in last year already three have, um, have been uh, proposed. There is a, a, a very um, a popular one which is licensed, which is called uh, Bionic. And uh, you can see in many glycoprogramics paper, this is the one that has been chosen. And it's not to forget that you can use the other proteomics search engine like Mascot or OMSA or Sequest that allow for the um, detection of uh, sugars. So 
really the panoramic view of those glycopeptide um, analysis software is very, very um, extended. And this is why Morton Tyson Anderson, who is uh, based in uh, Sydney uh, in Australia, decided that there should be a challenge to actually evaluate the performance of these uh, glycoproteomics software and the different strategies that are used with the software. So this is why he invited not only software developers, but users of software, uh, because the strategies of using the software are also important to um, get an overview of what's going on in glycoproteomics and how reproducible um, any approach is. So the questions are, can we uh, identify the correct peptide with the correct site, with the correct um, structure on it, possibility of modification on the glycans and on the peptide? So that's a real challenge. So the challenge was uh, set uh, uh, a few years ago. So they, they started, they, they actually, the, the results are just being published now. It's a bioarchive paper still under revision and uh, it will be published very soon. So, but they, they started already two or three years ago by selecting the sample, decided that they would go for n -no glycopeptide um, using so processing whoops uh processing the sample whoop, i don't know what's going on here i have something excuse me so um as, a, as I said, inviting not only developers to participate, but users to participate. So the, the idea is that Morton's lab actually did the analysis. So what they provided the participants were the raw data so that um, they, they wouldn't have to do, they, they knew that uh, they all started on the same foot with the same data and it was the responsibility of the developers and the users to process that data with the tools that they are developing or using. So um, they, they had those different files. So they had different methods that were tested because of course the software is sensitive to the different fragmentation methods that are used. So you had HCD, CID um, and uh, ETCID da uh, data. So this was also part of the, um, of the challenge. And um, they, uh, they got the participant details, they got the identification strategies. I mean, the, um, the, the organizers got this information. Um, they also asked for which N-glycan and O-glycan repository database uh, they were using. And, um, and of course they had to report the identification. So there was for um, testing and for um, evaluating, they had spiked some synthetic end glycopeptides. So to, to have a sort of control and uh, they had some um, uh, very specific uh, glycoprotein identification and so they measured the um, glycopeptide coverage. So they had all sorts of evaluation, evaluation criteria. And then they scored according to a number of criterion, a criteria I'm going to talk about as well. So for in glycopeptide, you can see here, so the, the, the software developers are in orange and the users are in blue. And you see an incredible variation in the um, level, the, the amount of um, identified and glycopeptide and uh, the, um, the, the different search spaces that they used, which was so, 
I, I uh, did not check, but when you have exactly the same search space here, in all likelihood, they're using uh, Bionic with the default parameters, just guessing. And um, so this, you can see, is already a little bit of a worry uh, in terms of uh, lack of rep reproducibility. Situation is hardly improved uh, with oglacopeptide, and um, you see that the, um, the distribution of results is um, quite hectic compared to um, what you would expect if they are doing the same thing. So the, for the evaluation, the organizers decided that they would separate different tasks. So they would evaluate um, the synthetic, I mean, the, uh, the, pos the capacity of, the, of each group to identify the synthetic and glycopeptides. Uh, this is for N only, we will do the O after. Um, to properly identify the N-glycan composition, the N-glycoprotein identity, the coverage of, uh, of the N-glycopeptides, the, and how common uh, the N-glycopeptides were across, and uh, they had a special uh, treatment for uh, the, the, the special um, salic acid UGC, which is not supposed to be in human, but uh, is sometimes uh, proposed as a possibility of identification. So they had this idea also, they had a list of what they thought would be important for each of these um, assessments. And they based the score on these criterion. And so each team was assessed depending on the task, how well they performed. So these are the score and depending on these um, different um, scoring criteria that are uh, specified in this um, table. So you can see it's heterogeneous. That's the least you can say. And uh, some teams that do well with one task uh, can do uh, less well uh, in uh, another task. And uh, this uh, is the same whether you're talking about the developers or the users. So uh, in the end, they try to correlate the success uh, of, the, um, of a software. So they had a list of um, uh, properties that were, I mean, the, the, the description, they, they had really asked the participant to thoroughly describe their approach. So uh, whether they, um, uh, they, they're using, for instance, uh, I mean, which enzyme they're using to, uh, to digest. So whether they use trypsin or they use another enzyme. So they, they, they have all these reported information for the uh, experiment. And they try to see whether there was a correlation between the high performance and those criteria. So they could strike out the importance of the protease specificity, for instance, and uh, they could actually um, also uh, uh, correlate with the, the space, the, the, the search space uh, is obviously important. Uh, and so this is a table that goes to show um, what seems to be important in the contribution to the score so that a, a method performs better than another. And in the end, uh, they, um, they had this uh, negative and positive correlation between the two types. Uh, they did the same with all glycopeptides. So same idea of assessing the different tasks uh, they didn't have spiked in uh, synthetic O-glycopeptides, so it was a little bit more difficult uh, in the end. But same thing, they could see that some team would perform well in uh, one task and less in the other. They could see that some teams would consistently perform 
relatively well or relatively not well, and so on. So they had different results and all the same, they tried to correlate. So they had uh, a few positive. So here the, the proteome specificity was more important than it was within glycans, for instance, and um, uh, retention time uh, contributed, uh, the inclusion of retention time data contributed also, et cetera, et cetera. So I, of course, um, advise you to uh, go to, to the, the paper um, that describes all, all of that in detail, but it's extremely telling about uh, a number of criterion and properties that should or should not be considered and um, the, also can guide you in choosing the software. Uh, there will be other challenges, uh, as far as I know, Morton is just getting out of this one, but he's preparing the next one because as, I, as you could see, um, the, the methods of mushrooming and already three uh, were published uh, last year, so uh, they need to be part of it as well. Problem is, database search, like you are um, uh, maybe used to in proteomics, is impossible. We don't have a database, yet we need a reference database. So this is what we're trying to do with Glyconnect, and we have those different approaches, uh, different um, uh, types of information where we are not restricted in terms of taxonomy. We take the papers um, if they are interested and they have good data, uh, irrespective of the species, but because a lot is published in human glycobiology, we, had a, we have a lot of human uh, sugars. So at the moment, we have um, quite a few structures that are really annotated. Our composition are also uh, growing. So, but importantly, what we do is to correlate to the tissue and to the conditions of expression, because this is a key to understanding black oscillation. And so sometimes we have disease information. And so we have a visualization tool that we call Octopus uh, that I will show you. And I wanted to insist on the fact that Morton's evaluation, as I said, is still a bioarchive paper. We have it in one of our references in Glyconnect. So they decided to share with us the consensus data. So the consensus data is limited. There's only 54 composition. And so the, there's only one source, it's a blood serum and 37 proteins. So that entails 69 peptides and uh, 76 glycosylation sites with a O or N. So this is um, a benchmark and uh, I'm happy to advertise it as a really important step milestone in what we're trying to do with glycoinformatics. So one of the things that we have al always noticed, and especially with the use of Bionic, as I said, that is a very popular piece of software and has a default composition file. But the effect of composition, of choosing, of selecting the composition file was highlighted in Morton's study, Morton's challenge. And we have been aware of that already for a while, looking at the data and trying to curate data for Glyconnect. And so this is why we put um, together a, a piece of software, which we call Glyconnect Compositor. So this is where you can find it. And the idea is that um, in, in most databases and in a, glyco, uh, in a glycan composition file like you find in Glyconnect, you have a set of compositions that seem to be unrelated because they are just a list of independent items. However, you can see that in this simple example, 
these compositions are not unrelated. This composition is related to this one through the addition of a Foucault's residue. So it can be um, uh, DX uh, if, if we're not talking mammalian sugars. So what we thought was that we should not give a list of composition, but a network of composition. So here you have different fucosylated composition linked to one another just by adding a few codes. And so we can generalize that with any monosaccharide, we can take a list of composition and whether you add a few codes or you add the hexose or you add a, a hexnac or you had the salic acid, you're just going to have in a set of composition, um, which composition are related to one another. So a glycome, according to glycoproteomics, is going to be um, a set of composition. So this is, for instance, what uh, Bionic um, proposes, although I think they use uh, if, uh, Fuc uh, instead of Dhex. Uh, but anyway, it's, it means the same in that case. And so a glycome can be a set of composition at the level of a site. It can be a composition at the level of a protein, and it can be a set of composition at the level of a tissue. And the more you try to see whether there is connectivity between those different composition, in fact, the more consistent your data set is going to be, because all we're doing is roughly approximating what the glycogen's activity is doing by synthesizing a glycan, because glycans are synthesized step by step. So one glycosyl transferase is adding one monosaccharide at a time. So it would be totally absurd to expect that if you have a full uh, glycan with a set of monosaccharides that compose it, that they would just randomly be put together. So indeed there is a hierarchy and this is what we're trying to capture by looking at a site, at a protein or at a tissue with the set of composition that we are uh, given from a glycoproteomics experiment. So here is an example, for instance, of what is in glyconnect with the protein, which is called the tissue type plasminogen activator, that has at least three, uh, two site, three sites, uh, glycosites and sites that have been identified where you have structures. So here, when you have a, a number, it means that there is actually two structures defined that have been associated with that composition. Yet when you see that, you have um, a, a very disconnected graph. And we were wondering, well, this is strange that they would be so um, far apart. And we introduced the idea of a virtual node. And you can see that if we re-establish, so maybe there's just one missing step. One missing step because in the identification, uh, the mass of the intermediary structure was so low that it was not picked by the program, or um, maybe it was uh, not expressed. Or God knows what the, uh, the, the, the explanation is. Yet, we're thinking of reintroducing some consistency and you can see who would have thought that in fact all those parts were connected just because there's one monosaccharide missing. So in this case here, to go from here to there, you just need, um, oh, I mean, for, for, for connecting these two, you need uh, a hexose or um, a hexnac. So you re-establish some kind of uh, consistency of the glycome associated with, for instance, in that case, a protein. 
So for 33 composition, we need six virtual modes. How is that? Um, I mean, um, we if we if we choose to um, customize a glycan composition file, then we're going to advise users of Bionic, for instance, if they are focusing for some reason on the tissue uh, plasminogen activator, we would suggest that they take all of these composition as a default file. And we can actually more and more prove that the virtual nodes are real. Here is the glycom for a human urine um, that we have accumulated over time. So six months ago, we had 75 composition. Then in the last six months, we've added more papers in the database and we have actually reached 84 uh, composition. So each time we were doing that composition graph with nodes for composition and edges for the addition of a monosaccharide. And I just took two excerpts. So this is an old picture. So the resolution is not as good as the most recent picture, but anyway, um, you can see that I've mapped this composition here, which is H3, N3, F1S2. So three hexose, three hexnac, one fucose and two cyanic acid. And I wanted to compare the environment. So in this one, I have highlighted the virtual node in red. Uh, that's another matter altogether. And in this network, the virtual node are in gray, like I showed you before. So if I do the correspondence, which uh, I did for you, because it's a little bit complicated otherwise, we can see a number of things. Sorry, it's a bit busy, but we can put these two in correspondence. We can put these two in correspondence. We can put these two in correspondence. And what you see, for instance, is that, ha, huh, our new paper is actually bringing a structure that wasn't there in the previous one. Same with this one, same with this one. So we had a really cool paper um, uh, from Katalina Medzeraski and, we could introduce all sorts of new um, structures uh, because it was glycomics experiments that uh, we were uh, mapping. And then there's this um, environment here where you see that uh, H2 and 3 F1 S1 uh, is uh, here now with three structures instead of one. Uh, and uh, all the others, well, they, they are still uh, without uh, structures or the same amount. And here we have no structures uh, that came. And here, a virtual node in the previous uh, discussion that, in fact, is a real node now with a structure associated. So it was not so crazy to suggest that just one monosaccharide was making the difference, but you could connect those nodes and now it's a reality. But unfortunately for the second one, we could not, it still remains a virtual node, but maybe when we reach uh, 95 compositions for urine, we'll have this uh, sorted out. So you can see that it is possible to assess the consistency of a glycome through those related compositions just by mapping them and seeing with one monosaccharide difference what it does. I have another example of how, uh, so this is my old urine. Uh, sometimes we have shapes, they're funny. We, we have animals, we have fishes, we have all sorts of uh, funny things that um, uh, crop up in our graphs. Anyway, that's anecdotal. Um, I want to, uh, so this is the same node um, that I can, a bit, uh, this is the same network I was showing. So this is hex3, uh, hexnax3 uh, and so on. So when you, in glyco, I will demo um, compositor, but 
each uh, node is uh, has a tooltip that tells you um, you can click on it and get to the composition. So um, if you click on this composition, you have a Glyconnect page that opens and we can use the annotation. So in Glyconnect, we have the information. Um, whoops, uh, sorry. Uh, we have the number of references. So for this composition, we have uh, five references that are associated with this composition. And so we have a number of proteins and so on. And what I was interested in looking at the composition. So this is reported in urine. So it's part of my urine gly glycome here. And I have some uh, sites that are uh, reported here. And this is my fourth, um, um, my uh, fourth um, reference. It's a glycoproteomics experiment, whereas these are coming from references here. So one, three, four, two, uh, five, two, so five uh, here, which are glycomics experiments. And what is interesting is if you look at the source, so you see that it's a, a fucosylated and silylated uh, structure, but you can see that in the differences here, your fucose is either alpha three here or alpha four here. So that is really, that can have a, 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 can make a really big difference. We are not sure. I mean, certainly in terms of recognition, you can see if the, uh, the fucose is on one side or the other, it's, ma it's making a difference. And then we look at the source. So here, this is expressed in granulocyte. This is expressed in neutrophil. Whereas the upper um, fucose is expressed in urine in that case, and is expressed in um, amniotic flu uh, fluid in that case. So the idea is that you see a clear difference between the different expression of these sugars and the position of the fucose seems to be correlated to being alpha-3 if we're talking um, blood cells and being upper if we're talking urine or amniotic uh, fluid. So I am not making any conclusion, but um, what I put forward with Glyconnect is that you have a possible hypothesis. You, have, you can make an assumption and say, well, in my sample here, because it's urine, in my uh, glycoproteomics experiment where I have only the composition, maybe I can guess that my structure would look like that and that the fucose would be located as alpha-4 and not alpha-3. Again, it's, a, it's an assumption. It's a guide. We are not pretending that Glyconnect is giving you the answer, but we are making suggestion and providing food for thoughts for people interpreting data and interpreting uh, glycomics, uh, glycoproteomics experiments. So, um, this uh, with uh, Compositor, we have been trying to assess the um, glycan composition files that are used in software. And for instance, in uh, a study on prostate cancer, um, the authors have used Mascot and they have used a composition file that you can guess from there is actually extremely regular in the sense that they have mechanically said, we take the, uh, this is N-glycan, so they take the core N-glycan with the two hexnac and uh, the three mannose, um, and they actually build on that. So they add mechanically one monosaccharide at a time so that the glycan composition file is a very tight mesh of um, fully, uh, 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 almost a fully connected, uh, here are some uh, large uh, glycans that are there that we can actually 
uh, hook in that area of the uh, of the graph. So this is a very regular uh, data set. It's no no judgment there. It's just an observation. And we have looked at uh, bionic, bionic used in uh, cere uh, cerebrospinal fluid in cancer and in uh, some cell secretome. And so here, um, bionic usually the default uh, site um, uh, set is um, 309, I think, end glycans. So we're talking end glycans again. So of course it's a it's a very busy uh, graph, um, and uh, you can actually see that the different usage of glycanex. So we have here the the main properties of the um, of the glycan composition, whether it's uh, oligomanose or high mannose or neutral or fucosylated, um, and uh, you you can see the bar chart that corresponds to each. And so here we have the intersection in magenta, in gold, the intersection between A and C. In between B and C, there's absolutely no intersection and ABC is common to the three sets. So ABC is probably the most um, regular end glycan that you expect to see uh, in, um, in a sample. And you can see that the magenta, which is the common to uh, the C uh, CSF and the, um, the secretome, they're sort of um, central and uh, going a bit external here, whereas the gold are sort of uh, located in one particular area. Again, no real conclusion from there, but trying to see, so you see that uh, we need 35 virtual nodes to actually complete the composition set of Bionic. So maybe they could actually include those 35 virtual nodes. We could provide Bionic users with the 35 uh, virtual nodes to add to their, um, but anyway, uh, what I'm getting at there is that each time you're going to do a glycoproteomics ex experiment analysis and that you're going to use a composition file, it is very important to do several testing with that composition file and to see, for instance, if you select, uh, if you're doing a urine sample and you select only the urine composition that we have in Glyconnect, like which of course is not comprehensive. We are fully aware it's not comprehensive, but at least you'll have something that will be, um, that, that will guarantee that you find what you expected to find. So that could be your bottom line. And then you add further some composition that are not in that set to see whether you can extend. And this would be really important um, to, to assess the quality of identification and um, prevent a lot of false positive uh, that are identified most of the time. So I'm done with that part. I will go for a demo, but I, I would like to give you again, um, another little break before I start refilling your brains. And um, I will start with uh, showing you simple uh, things that we can offer. So I will share my screen. So this is um, uh, protein entry of Uniprot. This is famous uh, Fetuin A, which is has been uh, known to be glycosylated for quite a while. So it's a um, glycoprotein. 
There's not even a keyword glycoprotein. Anyway, um, if we go to the PTM section, you can see that uh, it's annotated and it's um, actually annotated uh, as glycosylated with uh, a history here. You can see that you have, these are rare. There's a, a, a few hundreds of these. Um, this goes back to the time prior to Uniprot when it was Swiss prot and glycosylation was actually annotated in conjunction with a database that was called Glycosuite. And these were the uh, accession numbers of Glycosuite uh, DB. And Glycosuite DB uh, does not exist really, but yet it's reborn in like Connect. So we, we have it. So we have kept those sort of historical link so you can go directly if you click here to um, a special section of uh, Glyconnect with the uh, information on that uh, glycan. Well, this is it. So you have the uh, glycosylation information. But the, as I said, these are rare. And so, um, it's a bit anecdotal. So what is interesting here is that you have the PTM database and now you have the systematic cross-referencing of Glyconnect and Glygen. And uh, recently, the information about the number of structures that are there uh, is specified. So. Um, we have two N sites and two O sites. Uh, we have 60 N glycans uh, and uh, four O glycans on these different sites. And the, so I'm, I'm not quite, uh, so they have, uh, Glygen has 15 sites. So 29 N glycans on two sites and 11 O link uh, glycans. So on 10 sites. So you see that we are not necessarily taking the same um, uh, the, the, the same data and we are complementing each other and that's great and this is why the two resources are there. So if I go to the link um, here, you can see that this is the um, this can happen to you. So um, there is here in, um, in this area here, the possibility of uh, re, uh, choosing the SNFG, but we also have the text. So this is the IUPAC condensed and uh, uh, we can click on SNFG and we'll have our usual cartoons. This happens if, um, I'm not quite sure, uh, to be honest, um, but uh, there's something about um, using the browser in, in, in for the first time, I'm going to the site for the first time or not, or whatever. Uh, there's some reinitialization also of the process, so it happens. So you can see that in Glyconnect, we have, so the information on the taxonomy, we have the information. So here, this is the protein. We have the sources. So we know that this protein is found in, um, in blood, but it has also been found in uh, different uh, other uh, body fluids or in a gland. And it has been um, uh, associated also with some um, diseases, cancer, most of the time. And we have 15 references that are talking about this. So all in all, uh, four sites, as we said, two um, N sites and two um, O sites. And in some glycoproteomics uh, experiments, we have the peptides uh, that have them. And you 
also we it's uh, as uh, since there are so many um, uh, references so each time you can know which reference actually has identified which structure uh, you can click on the structure and sometimes you have two references that have seen it sometimes you have uh, more than two no not really and what is also uh, an important uh, part of it is that you can link the glycoproteomic, uh, so for instance, this um, was actually uh, resolved not very precisely, but precisely enough in the sense that uh, you know uh, at least the beginning of the, uh, of the structure. And it was um, identified on uh, this uh, site, but there's a, a glycoproteomics experiment which is listed below with composition. So here, for instance, this composition is from um, identified in many large scale. So these are uh, large scale uh, experiments. And so it's suggesting that there are two sites for that. And so it suggests a structure which is up there because um, it matches the composition and so and it has been identified before so this is exactly the example of what I said before in the presentation about matching glycomics and glycoproteomics experiments so glyco uh, glycomics in spy glycoproteomics and you we can navigate from the two types of experiments so we go back to this structure here and it's uh or yeah the, there was this one and we have a suggested site which is more than the site that was um identified simply because the glyco there's one glycoproteomics experiment that says that it was also seen on that site and then you have the peptide to back this information in this case. So this is the sort of information you find in a particular protein page. We can navigate all uh, across so we can uh, go and see uh, the milk for instance and here we have all sorts of um, uh, different and we can see that we have many proteins involved in milk. So I can go and see uh, another uh, protein that is also in blood. And we'll see another profile in, gee, this is slow. Um, and we have the same uh, sort of thing. So here, this one may be a bit more interesting because we have on the side a, um, a 3D structure that we can have a look at. And you, if there are more, we can see more. We're using this light mall um, software, which is now used in um, uh, Uniprot and it's also in PDBE and it is here using a plugin of Lightmall that allows to see the SNFG 3D uh, connections so you can see that in that particular uh, structure we had uh, a few cost so it could be this structure or this one or this one so there's quite a few and uh, this is it. So we can also investigate. Uh, so here there's quite a few structures, some glycoproteomics experiments at the end here. And each time you can also, of course, click on a composition and see what are all the structures behind that composition. 
which protein they're seen on, in which species, in which tissue, what are the references. We have sites, so and uh, peptides where you can actually see all of that. Very recently, um, no later than yesterday, <laughs> um, Julien has actually added, so if I go and see the proteins here, um, we, we, have, um, we are starting to give the uh, user the possibility of focusing on N-linked or O-linked and not mix the two, because sometimes it can be a bit confusing. And uh, we are aware of that, so we've decided to, um, uh, to make this actually upon the request of uh, one of our favorite better users, who is Daniel Coleridge. So you see, we are um, trying to be responsive when people suggest we should do things. So this is for looking at the data in GlideConnect. Uh, I should also say that any of the data, if you are interested in exporting, uh, you can export in CSV all the information that is in that page. So regarding the taxonomy, the, the protein, etc. You can also, um, here, if you want to copy the composition, because this is exactly the glycome you want for haptoglobin. So uh, you copy the in the clipboard on clicking on this, and this is it. This is done. So that can be uh, very useful um, for. I mean, we're really trying to to help the the building of um, composition. Um, another thing I wanted to say, no, I said the 3D, so I think I, I've, I've covered more or less, and so you, you see you can change um, the, the different views, and we have, of course, cross references, that's what I wanted to say, we have cross references with Uniprot, of course, with Nextprot when it's a human protein, uh, with glygen, so glygen points to us, but we point to glygen. And um, we have gene cards because of also for gene cards points to us in terms of um, uh, information for human genes um, in, um, in this database. And we also always have the link to compositor. So if you instantly want to see whether your uh, glycome, the glycome of your protein is consistent, not consist consistent. Uh, let's look at the end linked uh, here. So it tells us there are all these sites you add to selection. So you can include or not include the uh, virtual node. There's 86. Uh, compositions associated with haptoglobin. Uh, as you can imagine, it's a well-studied. And here is the, uh, the glycan. So you have here, you can see the, the distribution of properties. So there's a majority of fucosylated uh, that are there, located there. The neutral are also in the extremity and the center and uh, is uh, rather sad related. So you have, a, um, so if we include the virtual node, we'll have um, a slightly more tightly connected network. And we see how much we need to complete the picture. Uh, Network is not working. A, a compositor goes faster than that usually. Um, it's only because I had you, to migrate. Do you need to recompute the graph, Frederic? Yeah. Yes. I, I, I think you didn't click on the button. 
No, no, it's it's. Uh, I can see the the wheels spinning. But it's a little bit of a technical issue. Here you go. So you see that the graph is a little bit more connected. Um, I have three leftovers here. This one is always a bit left over because uh, it's uh, oh, it's not one that I know very well. Well, this one is is a bit. Uh, this one is only one he one hex next, so it's a little bit lost. And this one is um, a lost cause. I don't know why, but that's what it is. So what we have also with um, uh, uh, with the, um, uh, the compositor is that, as you could see, I showed you each time you can see on a node, uh, the uh, the structures that are behind each time you have a label, but we also look at the um, the paths that are connecting the nodes. So, for instance, if I want to zoom on a node, so I I look for the root with the root, which is here. So sorry, I have to. I have located the root, so now I zoom out to see. my complete so we're using we we're not uh responsible for the shape uh, we're using a, a library of uh, of graphs and so uh you can see here that most i mean the vast majority of the nodes are stemming from this one which is normal this is the core end linked and so all the end linked that are derived are coming from this one, except for this one, which is funny. And obviously, it's uh, it's an independent one uh, that uh, we have. So we have two roots for that uh, for that graph. And um, this is quite unusual, but that happens. And otherwise than that, everything is reachable except for that little path here. And uh, all the same, you can see that uh, if you have a terminal node somewhere, like this tetra antennary here, um, you you know it's actually uh, you know the path that is followed. So there's not so many paths. There's a unique path in that case to reach this one, which is not necessarily the case for all of them. So here you see for this one. Uh, you have several possible paths. And uh, all the same for this one, uh, this is, there's a unique path. So you can actually have a look if you want to see, for instance, uh, all uh, the fucosylated uh, structures, you can also um, mouse over the um, a plus F, and then you'll see everywhere fucosylation happens, but you can also see all the fucosylated structures from here. So you have different ways of considering this graph and uh, looking at it. So I will go back to Compositor, but what I wanted to do um, is from the home page, to show you the um, uh, the homepage as I showed you. So we'll go through the dedicated data sets tomorrow. I'm not going to talk about that soon, uh, but I want to talk about the octopus. So the octopus was actually um, defined or, or built to help people who have very limited knowledge of uh, glycans and they are not they couldn't be bothered drawing at glycan and interrogating a database and things like that but they know because they read the literature and they see for instance a glycoproteomics paper and and the comments of the authors is that um, they have um, complex glycans and um, 
these are the, the categories of cores. And for instance, they have a lot of uh, bisecting glycans. So you don't know what bisecting is, you don't know what really a complex. And so you see that vocabulary of, of um, and you can put uh, non-silated, but in fact, you change your mind, so you don't. So we just search um, glyconnect with these terms. So we end up with a big, um, we, we limit to Homo sapiens at the beginning, but if you want to see any other species, you can do it. Um, I could actually, uh, and well, what if, anyway, I, I think I had a less populated octopus. Um, what? I lost my sheet of paper where I had this. Sorry. Um, so here I see all the proteins that are, so I can zoom in a bit, have a look. I have the composition in the middle. So I have my proteins and that gives me, me an, an idea of the density of information in glyconnect. And so here, each time I see all these bisecting glucanacs, and I could actually, um, we, we are in the process of having uh, categories here where we can have, um, uh, we can ask for mammals as opposed to uh, only Homo sapiens, so we can see different things. Um, and the idea is that I, I see a high density uh, in some, some proteins here. Uh, and if I don't want to have composition in the middle, I, I, I look at the tissues. So already it's a little bit easier to see that I have tissues that are particularly, so this reflects, of course, the bias of the database. We have a lot of blood uh, expressed uh, glycan, uh, but we can see that, um, uh, for instance, which are the proteins that are expressed in the kidney, and we can see the um, which bisecting glucanacs are uh, in there, and you can browse and of course, each time, if I'm interested in seeing what's in the placenta, I click here and I get to the protein. And this is the, uh, uh, the hormones here that are heavily glycosylated. So I go back here and I want to see, uh, for instance, um, I, I change and instead of uh, wanting to see the, um, the structures, I want to see the sites. So I have the sites and the expression. So I can see that I have, um, in some cases, I don't have sites. I have obviously uh, as in association, but I don't have the sites. So I can also check how um, well defined my, my proteins are. And I can also try with disease. And I have this information as well. Go back to composition and see the connection, how dense it is with composition and so on. So this is a starting point for exploring the data. It's not actually giving you um, clear results. And then, um, I mean, although we, we're looking at having an export function to, to export all the compositions if you're interested in having them um, uh, from there. But that is uh, one thing we can do with the octopus. We can do a bit of O-linked. And for instance, we look at core two. And instead of looking at properties that are there, I would look at determinants. And for instance, I'm interested in all the, um, the, the O-linked structures that have core two and have a ligand, they, they contain a, a substructure, which is a ligand, 
that um, is there. And I have this uh, answer where I can do exactly the same. Uh, instead of composition, I'd like to see in which tissue it's expressed and uh, what's the density. So here you can see that I have a lot in, um, they are all linked with this particular uh, determinant here. And uh, we can see that there are uh, many structures associated with this here. So again, um, just as an example of what you can do to assess the density of information in Glyconnect and also query Glyconnect with very basic information as often expressed in the, in the databases. So um, one interesting uh, protein that we have because it is attracting a lot of attention. So if I go back to Glyconnect and I just ask the protein here, and I have erythropoietin. You can see that with erythropoietin, we have 18 references. The most recent have been added in uh, 2020, and it was another large scale. So again, erythropoietin has served us very much in, um, uh, in establishing the, uh, the, the reality of virtual node, because each time we have new, um, new glycans that with new papers and new composition, and we validate. Um, so you, you see here, this is what we have, and you can select. So I've done already, and I'm not going to, um, Oh, no, I have not done already. It's lost. That is not a good idea. So let me see. I had prepared stuff and it's gone. This was the other one. Okay. So let's look at the end linked. And what I was thinking is actually to show you the difference between the undefined. So here I can look at undefined. So you see here in my first selection, I have erythropoietin with the three well-known and uh, uh, sites. So uh, assigned sites and I have a 29 composition with undefined. That means that they cannot be uh, assigned because the experiment could not assign them. So if I compute the graph, which is going to take a little bit of time, unfortunately, because I'm a bit too far. I have to move closer to my source and it will work better. Okay, so we have a very busy, uh, because I mean, 129 is quite a few. And you can see the, um, where actually there's a possibility of assigning some sites because there is an overlap. There are 10 undefined that are not uh, comprised in the glycoproteomics experiments. And so unfortunately, um, we still cannot map them to assign them to a site. But there's all the others, there's at least, uh, so that's uh, one third we cannot and two thirds we can uh, assign them to, um, 
to uh, a site because there's an overlap between the site information and the composition and the, and the possible structures that are there. So um, you, you see, we need still quite a few virtual nodes. So in some cases, they are not absolutely required because um, here, for instance, uh, if, I, um, if I don't have this virtual node, I will still have the connection uh, of, of these nodes together. So it's not destroying. The, the idea is, um, I mean, when you think network biology, uh, the, 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 you always look at a node. If you take it out of the network, is it going to make the network collapse or not? Do you, will, will you break it into parts or not? And this one will not, but this, this one, um, which is here, will. Because if I get rid of these two, then all, these cannot be connected uh, in, um, with the rest of the graph. So this is the, the, the role of these two. So why aren't they, uh, you, you can see the massive structures here. Here you have, a, a very big structure, tetraantinary, um, with uh, 12 hexos. So it's a really big one. And, um, and that's why maybe inter intermediary structures are hard to, to detect uh, if they exist. So that shows you how to use um, Compositor with uh, a particular uh, protein and even looking at the different sites of the proteins and what you can get, maybe what you can guess from uh, a certain type of information uh, versus another. Um, I could use, again, a um, compositor to do a, com a, a comparison at the, uh, so I'm not going to take erythropoietin anymore. I'm going back to the top of the list where I have very similar proteins, but yet encoded on two different genes that are, uh, what is my alpha glycoprotein one that you can see here has only N-linked and I have glycoprotein two. that also uh, have similar sites, yet one extra in uh, position uh, 88. So I can compare site by site. I can compare all sites together. Uh, so I start with comparing all sites together. This is not a reflection on the tool, but unfortunately on my poor bandwidth. <laughs> um, so you see that they have a lot in common, yet from the distribution of one or the other, you see that there is a, a, a strong bias to salination with the first protein compared to the second. So most of the blue nodes disappear if I do that because the blue nodes are the first one and there's a bias towards salination. So that can be observed. And then for the second one, we have more neutral ones. So then, then for the first one, you see the neutral ones. So most of the red nodes that remain non-common, so all the magenta nodes are common to the two. So the red nodes that remain, in fact, uh, you, you can actually um, always pull on things to when they, they sort of uh, stuck together, it's always easy 
a bit easier uh, to, th this is, as I said, um, automatically generated, but it doesn't mean you cannot adjust things for yourself. So I go back to my neutral here. You see that all the red nodes disappear under the, the color because the uh, remaining structures here are uh, neutral. So you have the possibility of comparing like this, but you can also decide. So we um, stop again, start with glycoprotein one, and we're going to select only, uh, so I unselect everything and select only 72. And I have 26 glycan for this one. And I have here 72 as well. And I can, oops, sorry, I forgot to add to selection. This one, I add to selection, I have only 19. So, whether I find again this bias towards silylation in one and neutral to the other is a possibility. So I have silylation for that site in particular that is high. And the only ones that are not silylated are these ones, they, the neutral ones that uh, are not in the second one. So you see the, the tool is really very convenient and uh, we, we can, um, uh, you have different tabs so you can see uh, here, if I get rid of that, I'll have the, um, uh, the urine glycome that I said uh, before is there, so I have it in Homo sapiens. I can have a look at everything, but I would like to consider the O-linked. And these are the 84 um, composition I referred to. And this is another animal now that we have with the um, not sure what it is, but uh, this is the the urine glycome, and you can see the structures associated, and uh, so on. So regarding O, actually, I had quite um, an interesting example to show you. Uh, if I uh, go back here, most of the proteins that you see of course, have a uniprot accession number. But in biology, we are stuck with very difficult proteins like uh, mucins. And so there's a lot of very interesting glycomics experiments that are made um, from, uh, from a mucin. Um, and mucin, as you know, is the main component of mucosa. So I will show you, if I go to source, I'll go back to the mucin and I take the um, colonic mucosa here that I add to selection. Then I take my protein here that I add to selection. So you see, I have 102 composition associated to those unspecified mucins. And then I go back to here and again, I want to have a look at the pulmonary mucosa where I have 82 and I will compute the graph of these unspecified mucins and whether I can locate them in terms of which tissue they seem to belong to um, 
whether it's uh, you, you can imagine that the colonic mu mucosa and the pulmonary mucosa are going to be very different. So can I see these differences at the level of my um, graph, which will come, do not despair. This is not a demo effect, this is a poor bandwidth effect. Here we go. So we're more fishy in this one. And I can move this a bit so that you see everything. I can only move one at a time, sorry. Here we go. So you have a full view on uh, on that, and you can see again that the um, the bar chart is really showing uh, different distribution for the properties. So you will obviously have uh, a very fucosylated uh, mucin here. And uh, you can see that you have a very silylated uh, colonic um, mucosa and uh, again, a rather highly fucosylated uh, pulmonary mucosa. So <clears throat> as a result, um, if you really want to focus on which part, you, the, the, the graph is rather partitioned. So the black ones, are those that are common. So, you know, your really regular O-linked uh, sugars with uh, not much um, specificity. Uh, so they are all common. And uh, this is uh, really the smallest and everything stems from there, obviously. Um, and here, if you, if you look at, at um, these different, they, they are a bit more specific uh, determinant here. And if you look at these ones, they are a bit longer. So in the um, colonic mucosa, you have sort of elongated structures like that. And here you have very fucosylated structures all around and you can see, so the partition for the pulmonary um, mucosa is, um, is visible and the colonic, which is around there. And finally, some other mucins um, left here uh, with um, not much to, to say about, but um, the, the, there's hardly anything um, common between the the unspecified mucins and the colonic. There's absolutely nothing between the colonic and the pulmonary. Um, there is, of course, obviously a lot of these mucins were from the pulmonary uh, mucosa, and uh, this is what we have in the end. So the idea there is to um, try to, to again assess the consistency of a set of composition. And if I were to actually study uh, colonic mucosa uh, or uh, pulmonary mucosa, I would start with a set of compositions that seem to be uh, specific according to these data. I think I will stop here. There's, um, I, I would love to take some questions. I've been speaking a lot. <laughs> <laughs>